Yeah, so um, seems like time's flying when you're in the season. But uh, got back uh, Saturday, which was Sunday for us. Uh, that's why I'm kind of thinking a little bit. So it was Sunday. So we did our complete Sunday on Saturday. Um, we graded the film as coaches. We talked about it, critiqued it, did all those things. Then we had a team meeting. Uh, we watched the game again. We talked about it, put it to bed. And then we started as coaches. We started to get ready for San Jose Saturday night now. And then leading into Sunday, all day Sunday, we worked on San Jose. And then we've been doing that all morning today. So um, it's been a lot of uh, – Game planning, looking at ball, and also for the players, a lot of training room, getting treatment, getting healthy. So uh, it's beneficial on the back end of a short week. The short week, the actual week is hard, but the back end, you kind of can take a little deep breath and get right. Can you share a bit about your experience in the San Jose State rivalry and uh, what it's like coaching this game? Yeah, I mean, it's always a battle. I mean, it always is a battle. I can go back to when my brother's playing San Jose. Um, you know, you, you have to bring it. You have to bring your A game. Um, you're, you're fighting for that Valley trophy as we have now, but just Valley pride in general because um, they talk about Valley. We talk about Valley. So um, it's always, always, always going to be a high-energy emotional game. So we have to be prepared for that. Um, I can remember a ton of plays happening when I was playing in the game. So um, just excited to be able to see two good teams go against each other. And at least with conference realignment, this is the last one on the books in this stadium. Do uh, you have any thoughts about the future of this rivalry and if it should continue? Yeah, you know, hopefully we still can figure out a way to play each other because it's been so long that we've been playing against each other. You look forward to that game. So um, conference realignment is out of all our control. It seems like it's just picking up more and more steam. So we'll see where all that goes. But to uh, be able to play them, no matter what, it's always a special moment, and uh, hopefully we can continue it somehow, some way. Coach Skipper, uh, last week's win was defense and special teams dominated. What did you feel about the identity of this team? And is that the identity of this team, relying on defense and special teams? Uh, I, like I always say, every game has its own life and history. So how that game was, we knew we were in a four-quarter fist fight. We knew it was going to be that way. Their offense is structured to minimize your possessions on offense for us. So it, uh, we had to get stops on defense. It took us a little while to get uh, going a little bit in the beginning. They gave us some new looks. They had some razzle-dazzle stuff going on a little bit in the first half, and they hit some shots, uh, deep balls. So um, that got them going a little bit. But once we settled down at halftime and we really had them figured out and things, we started flying around and playing a lot harder. Um, you saw that show. Then on special teams, which we always consider special teams our point of difference, uh, it finally made a big impact in that game, and we played really hard. But I was proud of the offense, too. I mean, their possessions are minimized. We put the ball in the end zone, and we got first downs late in the game. So um, I thought all three phases did a good job and played well. So whatever the identity is for each game is what it is in order to win. So the main objective is to play Bulldog football. If we play Bulldog football, we'll be fine no matter who we're playing. To rely on the run and to not have your starting running back but still get the production from Gilliam and Donaldson, what can you say about the efforts of those two young men who filled in for Sherrod? Oh, definitely. Hard-working kids, ready to go. I mean, they've been ready since we started camp. Um, once you get your opportunity, now you got you got to make the most of it. And they have definitely done that. I think you're seeing two guys that are getting better and better as the weeks keep going. So I'm excited about them. They're very physical runners. They're downhill runners. They make people miss. And they're very smart. We can do multiple things with them. So I'm um, excited about those two guys. And then they're going to honor Ron Cox on Saturday. Do you have a relationship with Mr. Cox, or what can you share about what you know about him? Yeah, actually, I just got off the phone with him about an hour ago. was talking to him. He's teammates with my brothers, teammates with uh, Coach Williams and Coach Franklin. So um, high-energy guy, a baller, tremendous stats. Like, I read his stats, I'm like, I can't believe this is true. Uh, 50 sacks is crazy. What is it, 28 in one season? Like, come on, man. And NFL player, um, I was a linebacker, so I look up to the linebacker guys, even though he was an edge rusher, 3-4 type guy. But um, just a mean dude that, that loves ball. Just talking to him on the phone, I, he was like he was hitting me through the phone with his voice. So um, excited to see him when he gets here. And, man, you talk about somebody uh, deserving the ring of honor and things like that. First defensive guy, though, it took way too long for that, by the way. But uh, I'm just excited for him and happy for him. 
Good morning, Coach. Uh, Good morning. Can you just talk about, with everything that's kind of going on this week, how you try to focus in, obviously, on the things that matter with the ball game, you know, with this Mountain West contest? Oh, yeah, definitely. So, you know, it's homecoming week, right? We got the blackout, and you got Ron Cox deal going on. But in college football, you're always going to have themes and stuff going on each week. So we're kind of used to that sort of stuff. Um, our objective is the game. That's bottom line. That's, what we, that's why we're here. So I don't think we'll have a problem as far as focusing in on that. Um, we have a lot to play for, and uh, we're excited about playing Bulldog football. We're excited about the things that are going to happen in the stadium. We're excited about the stuff that goes around it because it all leads up to the game. So our focus is going to be so heartily, completely on the game, and that's it. And talk to me a little bit about some of the things that San Jose State kind of presents uh, problems in this ball game coming in. Oh, yeah. Uh, man, they're a really good team. They're playing really well together. Um, their offense has a lot of playmakers. They're very explosive. Um, their wide receiver group is as fast as any and as good as any and making plays. Uh, number three, Nash, he's like, all you see him do is getting touchdowns. I mean, he's very productive, one of the top receivers in our conference. And then as you start thinking it's all going to be passed and they got a little back that's elusive and making people miss and he's getting long runs and ripping them off. People are, it's hard for people to tackle them and get them down, so doing a good job with that. And then on defense, they're just disruptive, you know. Their middle backer, I think, leads the conference in tackles right now. Their D-line's moving around. They're going to blitz you when you're not expecting it and things like that. They play sticky in coverage, so it's going to be a real challenge. Um, their head coach, winning his coach in Naval Academy history, so um, there's a lot of storylines to it, and that's not even getting to the off-the-field stuff. So it's going to be a battle, and we have to be ready to go. Hey, Coach, with Ron Cox also being a Valley guy, you know, born and raised here, what do you think that says about football in the Valley as a whole? Oh, that's a big deal, you know, especially like a lot of people right now think Washington Union High School is a basketball school, you know, but they have ballers at football also. So um, I think it's a big deal. Um, you know, just Valley football in general for years and years and years have been a lot of of good football players, and that's continuing now. I mean, it's constantly, you just watch high school ball here, it's getting better and better and better. It always has to start from the guys in the past, but I think the future's very good too, and it'll keep on picking up. You're seeing a lot more people recruiting out here and things like that, taking that flight to Fresno. So um, it's always a challenge for us in recruiting because people are see how we play, and then they're like, hey, where are they getting their guys? And they see most of our rosters right here in Fresno, so trying to uh, poach and steal some of our guys. But um, the football here is rich, and we're going to continue that. Coach, I don't know if this is the right way to describe it, but was it fun being in the mix, you know, fourth quarter and knowing that, hey, these, these game-deciding decisions are on my shoulders? <laughs> That's a good question. I really didn't have fun until it was zero seconds on the clock and we had to win. Um, I was in deep thought for most of it um, because it came down. Those clock situations, you're thinking and you're thinking. And the part that you don't know is are they going to call timeouts? When are they going to call their timeouts? And then you have to have a plan off of that. So um, I really didn't take a deep breath until the game was over. Um, I just looked up, and all of a sudden the clock was running, and we were in a Hail Mary mode, and they threw it. We knocked it out, and then I kind of was breathing again. So um, it felt good to get the win. Um, excited for the, how the guys stuck together, kept playing hard. Um, you know, there's a lot of noise out there, and people they, thinking we're going to separate in that, but we stayed a fist. We stayed together, and we kept playing hard. It's a it's a blackout uh, on Saturday. You got the black sweatshirt I got the black, on. Had black on Friday too, by the way. <laughs> nice. nice. Um, describe what that does, you know, for for a team, for players, just the juice that that brings. Yeah, a ton of juice, energy, and emotion. The red wave, whether we're wearing red, black, whatever, always helps us. But I think the new little twist with the black and it's Halloween coming up, I think it's hitting at the right time. I'm excited about it. I'm looking forward to it. I've never been a part of a blackout here, so um, I know they did something similar to the team wore black uh, in times past, but I wasn't here at that time. So I'm excited just to see what the stadium looks like when there's all black in there and things like that. I know the players are. When we were in camp, we showed them the uniforms and things like that, and they went crazy. So now they get to live it and put it on and go, go to work. So I'm excited to see what it brings. And uh, just curious, um, you know, because at least generally speaking, sometimes, you know, defensive coaches like to run the ball, win with defense, <laughs> win with special teams. Is your personality kind of trickling in to that offensive game plan a little bit? Uh, I like winning in the trenches, whether I'm offense, defense, whatever. And I've coached on offense, too. So in my, my family of coaching, everybody's on the offensive side. I'm the oddball in my family. So um, I understand winning in the trenches on both sides of the ball. 
I'm a guy that likes to impose our will by out hitting the opponent. I, I enjoy that part of the game. So um, always when I watch the film, I'm, first thing I'm looking at is what's happening in the box, what's happening at the stuff people don't look at. You know, a lot of people look at the quarterback and receivers and that stuff. I'm into the uh, gritty stuff, not the cute stuff. So um, I do enjoy that part of the game. Very well said, Coach. Very well said. Um, how's it going? All right. Um, that game was um, a big victory, but a very important one. Uh, do you think of, um, for the next few games going forward that each one is kind of being indicative of um, showing that you are the uh, permanent man for the head coaching job? Uh, I don't really worry about all that. I think winning takes care of everything. Um, makes me smile and laugh and be my normal self when we win, so I enjoy that part of it. But we are in conference playoffs right now. Every game's going to matter. We're just focused on being 1-0. and That's it. As a team, as coaches, we just want to win each game. And like I said before, each game has a different life and history to it, different schemes, different players. So we're going to have to adapt. We have to have a good plan as coaches, and then the players got to got to execute the plan. So that's all our focus is on right now. Sure. And I got something that says 12 players have earned their first career starts, and that's eighth um, most in the FBS. Uh, how important will death be going forward for the rest of the season? Very important, especially in the Mountain West Conference. You know, uh, the, the, the healthy teams always finish, seems like, at the top when you get to the end of the year. So our, our depth is really good. I think we practice to where those guys get a lot of reps. So um, new guys have to step up and play, and uh, we, you saw that on uh, Friday night, and you'll continue to see that as the season goes. The guys that are ready to go, pick up the flag and let's go. Let's go play, play Bulldog football, and we'll be fine. And you said you were able to evaluate the tape. Um, you pretty much mentioned, you know, what you saw from San Jose State. But this, in this regard, what did you see from your team, and what do you want to see the Bulldogs do and not to do on Saturday against the Spartans? I'm gonna be totally honest with you. The thing I saw the most and the most proud of was how we were excitement-wise when we made big plays off the field. Like our sideline was electric. They were into it every single play. Guys were jumping up and down on the sideline and, and cheering on the guys that were out there on the field. I think that's such an important piece of the puzzle. I think it's something we didn't necessarily do every single game. There was times we make big plays and nobody was excited about it um, for whatever reason. So I felt like we corrected that on Friday night. And and that's going to have to be there for every single game that we keep playing. And then especially when we're in Valley Children's Stadium, now we get the crowd involved with it, along with the players. Now you have something magical happening. So that's the thing I was most proud of for that game, believe it or not. Coach, I know your memory is better than mine, but uh, no. didn't you have your first career interception against San Jose State? Oh, golly. Um, yeah, you have a better memory than me. Uh, I, I, I know Coach Coyle will have comments on that one. Um, and if you want to add to it, it was my second to last game of my career. So it took a long time to get that pick. But it was, it was a nice pick. It was one-handed. You know, I was going off balance. It was Marcus Arroyo who ended up coaching also, too. So, um, yeah, it felt good, and it was at their place, too. So your memory is crazy. Well, and I'm sure you remember the intensity of the rivalry, especially the coach you played for and how he played it up. Yeah. How are you framing this for your team, what this rivalry means on top of the stakes? Yeah, so we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow morning when we have our team meeting. Um, I hear about it from all the old heads, my brother, Jethro, Coach Hill, JD, everybody, Coach Tefford, everybody, everybody talks about it, right? And it, it is a intense rivalry. It's a game that both schools look forward to. Um, we're right down the road from each other. We battle on recruiting. We battle with everything, right? Um, we battle with just our branding of our school. So I'm excited about it. I'm excited that Ron Cox is going into the ring of honor this week. So hopefully we can get him here and he can talk to the team a little bit too, give him some of his past passion. So um, it's a big game because it's the next game and it's also because it's San Jose. So excited and ready to go for for it. All right, thank you. Morning, everybody. So should we start with your review of Coach Skipper's only career interception against the Spartans a quarter century ago? Well, I just heard his explanation, and uh, as he uh, said he was off balance and one-handed. Yeah, he was kind of stumbling and uh, stuck his hand out behind him and made the play. It's funny because uh, we had uh, – I used to give him some flack about the fact that he didn't have any picks in all those games that he started. 
uh, and uh, and finally he came up with the big one. And he was I could still remember him in the locker room after the game, being so excited that he got the pick and and we had the big victory. But uh, yeah, Skip was uh, was quite the player, but uh, interceptions weren't uh, one of his top top statistics. But uh, <clears throat> tackles were, you know, and uh, that. Uh, that's what it's all about, playing middle linebacker. And before we talk about the challenges San Jose State poses, how about your defense in the second half Friday night to go from you know, a halftime deficit to shutting them out in the second half and knocking the quarterback out of the game? What do you think made the biggest difference? Uh, we we kind of we settled down. We, uh, we had uh, – uh, we, we felt – we gave up a couple of plays in the first half, big plays, which is not characteristic. But uh, we uh, we were controlling their run game, uh, maybe a little bit better than it looked uh, as we came into halftime, and then uh, we kind of simplified it a little bit. But we also got them into some, as I mentioned last week, we felt if we could get them into some second and longs. Uh, and control first down, we'd have a chance to do some things, which allowed us to pressure. We come up with a couple of big sacks. Um, and then, um, you know, we had good field position, which also helped us a lot. You know, the, our punter did an exceptional job of pinning them down, and uh, we we had them backed up. So that uh, is an area of the field that we take a lot of pride in and that we're going to get stops, and we actually call it our score zone. It's our chance on defense to either score points or set up points for our offense. And uh, that was big. But our guys executed. You know, they really they competed hard. They didn't flinch when things got a little tough uh, there in the first half. And uh, we felt and talked about it at halftime. We just go out and we shut them down the second half. We were going to win the game. And uh, we did. And that was uh, credit to the players. And you faced some uh, pretty talented receivers already this year. But looking at Nick Nash and, and his development over the years, what impresses you about the season he's having? Oh, it's, it's incredible. Uh, everybody knows uh, that he's their main target, and yet uh, he comes out of every game with about <laughs> 10 catches and 140 yards and so on and so forth. Uh, he's a very smooth, crafty, uh, good-sized target, uh, gets good body position on defenders, has exceptional uh, – uh, ability to make plays, contested catches when guys are on him. Um, he's uh, he's the real deal. You know, we've been watching him all year from the very beginning, and um, I think he's uh, he's got 72 catches right now. And I don't know where that is in the country, but I'm sure it's way up there. Um, and uh, you know, he's certainly a guy that uh, you, you gotta you gotta contend with and uh, have a plan for. But they do a good job of spreading the ball around as well. I mean, the uh, the other guys don't have as big a numbers, but they're factors. And if you try to overplay one guy, you'll uh, see them take advantage of that. And uh, I think. Um, I think they're sixth in the country right now in in passing offense, which is seems like every week we're we're at we're talking about somebody's stats being in the top ten offensively, you know. Uh, but uh, you know, so they are throwing it around, and uh, and when you do try to deploy your defenders to stop the pass, uh, that opens up the running game for them, and uh, they take advantage of that. Yeah, Coach, uh, I mean, San Jose State did not lack any passing before, but um, what stands out about this particular spread and shred scheme that you see? Um, is that what they call it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I didn't know that. But uh, uh, they do certainly spread you out. They, they, they're uh, opened up formations primarily. Um, they have extremely wide splits at times with their receivers. Uh, they, uh, they try to get – isolation uh, situations on linebackers and or defenders that they want to try to exploit. Um, they, uh, they have a very good vertical passing game and off the vertical passing game, they have a lot of uh, built-in option routes. Teams like this, uh, they, they call a play, but it may look like five or six different things um, at the end of the day because the receivers are reading coverages. It's not just the quarterback reading coverages. They're all reading coverages. So 
one route may start one way uh, versus a certain coverage, and it's an entirely different look versus a different coverage. So um, they, they have to be very smart, very in tune with uh, uh, reading what the defense is doing. So that's what makes it so hard to cover. Um, you know, they, it's, it's one of those types of offenses that at the end of the day, you know, like the old run and shoot offense and, and the Mike Leach uh, offense, which is a, a kind of a disciple of that, um, they're always going to have the right answer at the end of the day versus what you're doing. And um, you have to try to disguise things. Uh, you have to win one-on-ones. It comes down to having to execute and your guys making plays on on throws that uh, that they're 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 attempting to to uh, exploit something that you're doing. So it's a, it's a big challenge. It's a, it's a very very good offense and a schematically a, a big challenge. We've asked the question a lot of Mondays about having to face multiple quarterbacks. They recently worked in the second QB. What stands out about both of them? You know. When I watch the tape, they both appear to be very good, and they both uh, – uh, at first, you know, I wasn't noticing the change in quarterback. I was looking at the big picture schematically of the routes and and how they were uh, protecting the quarterback and things of that nature. We're still uh, going to spend all afternoon discussing those things. Um, I don't think their uh, game changes. Uh, it's not like one is a runner and one is a – thrower they both throw the ball exceptionally well and um, uh, they can get out of trouble when they when uh, you, you pressure them they they uh, are, have done a phenomenal job of uh, not getting sacked throughout the season I think they only have seven sacks for the season for a team that throws the ball as much as they do that's pretty amazing uh, I think they're averaging approximately one out of every 40 passes to be sacked and uh, and, you know, so it's tough to get to them. Uh, even uh, they get the ball out on time. Uh, the quarterbacks have a good feel for where the pressure's coming from, and they drift away from it and get, get the ball out of their hands, and uh, they don't sit back in there, sit back there patting the ball, looking to, to, for somebody to get open. The ball gets out. They do not, uh, uh, you know, their protection, uh, their offensive line does an outstanding job that way as well. And uh, two games ago, we saw Jakari Embry at Nickelback. On Friday, we saw R.L. Miller. Um, can you share a bit about the confidence and why he got that uh, start and kind of the overall state of the position? Well, um, R.L. Did a, a, did a fine job the other night, uh, played very physical. Uh, we, we felt, um, I think I may have mentioned it last week, that uh, he's kind of that hybrid safety, nickel, outside linebacker type body. Um, can do a lot of things really well. And uh, we felt in that game, with their running game, we were going to need that type of guy out there. And uh, he stepped up big time. Um, he wasn't perfect, especially early on. There was a couple of plays that kind of got out. But he, uh, he stayed very calm for a young player, for a guy that hadn't played a lot and uh, knew the corrections that needed to be made and really played, I thought, a, a heck of a game for us, and particularly in the second half. He was all over the place. He was uh, making plays on the perimeter. Uh, he was blitzing. He did, he did a lot of good things, and he'll only get better from that experience. And so having him play quite a bit and Jakari play a lot the last week, and Jakari had his role in the game as well, um, We've developed a little bit of uh, depth at that spot, and we're going to need it here uh, as we start to pa uh, face these passing teams down the, down the stretch here. Morning, Coach. Morning. Uh, that Dean Clark targeting call seemed like Clark committed to the tackle at the same time Lewis slid. Is there anything you can teach the guys about trying to avoid that hit, or is that just inevitable? Uh, well, we do teach, and we do uh, uh, explain and coach it up. Uh, you know, Dean, his uh, response when I spoke with him afterwards was on film that that particular quarterback uh, had not – he had, he was not a guy that was going to slide. He was a run, you know, he was a runner. He ran like a running back. He uh, There weren't many examples, if any, on film where he slid. So Dean thought he wasn't going to go down. And uh, when he did go down, I, I thought Dean Dean's mistake – was he did lower 
his, uh, you know, his shoulders and uh, his head uh, as the guy went down rather than he could have, I thought, dove right over the top of him and missed him completely. Um, you know, I think it was a type of play where he had to make a fast decision, and he did. But at the time, if he saw him going down, I wish he could have avoided that. But uh, with that being said, I was really, really proud of Jaden Davis when he came in the game. Uh, he played over 40 snaps. And uh, really, for a guy that uh, didn't get a lot of practice reps last week, uh, stepped up big time for us. And uh, I thought he had a real solid game coming in for Dean. And that's going to help us down the road as well. And then my other question is about the second half defense. Second straight week, we see the defense uh, shut out an opponent, or almost shut out an opponent in the second half. Are defensive adjustments real? Like, what is behind <laughs> the switch between the first half and the second half defense? Um, you know, I've said this before. There's, <laughs> there's not a lot of adjusting that, that goes on at halftime, to be quite honest with you. There are some things. And really, last week, we, uh, we, we did simplify it a little bit after we saw what they were trying to do against us from a running game standpoint. But, uh, um, you know, at halftime, we review, uh, we go over the mistakes, and then we discuss what our plan is for the second half. And uh, fortunately, this week, uh, we did get them behind schedule early on in the second half and, and played well. But I'm looking forward to the games where we're going to play four quarters uh, and play good in both halves. And let's be talking about how good we played in the start of the game in the first half as opposed to the second half. You know, uh, we got we to be uh, more consistent that way. We have to play 60 minutes of Bulldog football, and uh, hopefully we'll see some of that as we go ahead uh, down, the, down the road here. Good morning, Coach. Morning. Uh, can you just talk to me a little bit about starting back on Friday, Malachi Langley's performance, and what it was like, obviously, after the game to see the accomplishment and the milestone that he was able to reach? Yeah, um, you know, Malachi just is a, is a gem. He's a great guy to coach. You know, he, he doesn't talk a lot. He's real serious and uh, very, very well prepared. Um, you know, I was really happy for him to see him come out in a game that was so important and so tight to make those impact type plays that he did. Um, he was all over the place. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Credit to him. Uh, I think our linebacking core, as a, as a group, were you know ha have been playing solid all year long. Um, but uh, between the way he played. Um, and the way uh, Devo Bridges also was exceptional in the game. Those were our two defensive players of the week, and uh, we we uh, we needed every every play that they made. But uh, it's great to see that Malachi guys were giving him a hard time. That he's been here for ten years. That's why he's he's now uh, you know in the top ten in tackles. Uh, but he's chasing Coach Skipper, I guess. So uh, that's a you know that's a good thing. He's in that el elite group. Um, and he's very proud of that, and we're very proud of him. No, for sure. And then moving on into this week, can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, obviously Nash, dynamic playmaker. Is there any thoughts about having a corner travel with him, or <laughs> do you kind of feel just across the board, whoever matches up is, is kind of good to go? Um, I can't discuss my plan. <laughs> um, but, no, seriously, uh, there's, there's certain things you can try to do against a guy like that. Um, and we will try certain things, but um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you got to play what you do well and you do best. And we've got guys uh, that we feel will uh, will will match up and do do the best job they possibly can with him. Um, he he he's a guy that they move around too. You know. Um, you can uh, look at the film, and we've been studying where they deploy him. And it, you, you know, you wish it was one spot so you could say, "Hey, let's do this." But sometimes he's number one in two by two. Sometimes he's number two in two by two. Sometimes he's into the boundary. Sometimes in three by one, he's the single receiver. Sometimes he's the number one receiver to the trip side. He he moves all over. So uh, and they do a good job with that because teams do try to. Uh, scheme up how they want to try to cover them. So um, we'll have some things that we, we do that are maybe a little different, but at the end of the day, who's ever on them, we got to know where he is, number one, 
uh, and uh, and try to uh, do the best job we can to slow them down. Coach, I'm just curious um, if the San Jose State Fresno State rivalry doesn't continue um, after this year. What's being lost? Well, you know this this has been a big rival. From I can recall back when I was here in the '90s, and uh, just talking with Jethro, how big it was. I can still recall having Jethro get up in the defensive uh, unit meeting, or uh, our last one before the game, and him talking to the kids about how important it was and the passion that he had back then. And um, you know, uh, it it it. It really made uh, an impact on our players back then. I remember we went out, we played really well a couple of times against them, and uh, they had some good ball clubs. Uh, but uh, I think it'd be sad uh, for for the rivalry to end. Uh, there's certain rivalries that that just should continue, you know. But unfortunately, this day and age, you see some of that. You lose some of that uh, in football, and uh, uh, you know, I would I would hope that it wouldn't. It wouldn't be that way, but uh, I know there's going to be a lot of emotion. We they uh, they did a number on us last year, uh, and uh, I know it's different teams, but it's still it's us against them, and uh, you know we have to prepare to play our best uh, in order to have a chance to have a victory. And uh, it's going to be a lot of excitement for this game, and uh, I'm looking forward to it. We know you as kind of an old school guy, but do you <laughs> notice a difference with like? A blackout in all black uniforms, especially on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, I don't know. I, I uh, you know, I kind of like the red myself. But uh, but anyway, uh, I know the players do because when uh, they saw the uniforms uh, back, I, I think it was in the spring or maybe it was in preseason camp. I can't remember right now when they uh, announced that they were going to have uh, the opportunity to wear that. They were jacked up, and uh, I think. Um, that's that's a good thing, you know. That'll that'll add some excitement. But again, once you, <laughs> once you kick the ball off, you you're not worried about what color uniform you're 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 wearing. You worry about can we cover number three and can we cover number eleven and can we tackle these running backs? You know, uh, you can be wearing purple out there it wouldn't make a difference in terms of that so uh, um, but it'll hopefully look cool and uh, fans will like it and you know probably sell some merchandise whatever that's a good thing <laughs> sounds like a good idea coach how's it going yeah, good um it says that your defense leads the Mount West in total defense what's it like knowing that um all everything that you've been dumb teaching your guys and stuff like that is not only showing up in the games but showing up on paper as well well, um, that's uh, it's nice to hear, but yet I don't I don't quite feel like we're playing as well as we can possibly play, and uh, we're going to face some of our biggest challenges here as uh, we go against some of these teams that are still high powered offenses uh, as we as we move forward here. Th particularly, you know, this team this week, their ability to throw the ball. Um, so. Um, the bottom line, the stats we're most concerned about is scoring defense, and uh, and we we've got to you know we're not where we want to be in that that category at this point. So we got to really tighten down and and keep uh, keep pressing to get better and better. Uh, but uh, you know this is a competitive conference. There's a lot of good offensive teams, and uh, you know we just got to play our best one week at a time, and hopefully uh, we'll continue to to be, uh, you know, moving in the direction we want to be. Oh, for sure. And you were um, mentioning um, Devo and Malachi. I mean, not enough can be said about those guys, though, but the entire front seven you know, yeah. showed up against um, Nevada. You s accumulated something like four overall sacks. So overall, the front seven did tremendous. Uh, what do you want to see them carry over um, into San Jose State to repeat a type of performance like that? Yeah, you're correct. The uh, The front uh, was uh, the difference in the ball game. Uh, Couple of guys I haven't mentioned yet, but uh, uh, Kavika and uh, Gabriel Lightfoot, uh, both those guys playing inside, uh, taking on double teams, fighting their tails off all night, and the discipline that we had up front. We felt going in, into that game as as we talked about defending that style of offense. You know, the, your your assignment perfect is the key. 
you know, playing your responsibility, staying in your gap, knowing when you have the quarterback or uh, you have the dive or you have the pitch, whatever. And our guys, as the game went on, really exhibited a very good discipline that way and played physical, really physical up front. And we were attacking blockers on the perimeter, all those kinds of things that you'd like to see. So if we can just continue to do that, it will be a little different this week uh, in terms of the style of offense that we'll play. But uh, the bottom line is you, you win games by execution up front, and uh, they, uh, they have been playing well throughout the year. No, for sure. And I was um, asking uh, Coach about, you know, the depth um, that um, this team has. And obviously it's been, you know, everyone on the team, though, but especially with the defensive unit, obviously with Cameron Brecca out and then obviously the you know, targeting penalty with Dean Clark. Uh, the secondary, was, and especially the safeties, was mostly filled with depth players. How important will the depth be going forward for the rest of the season? You know, you, you can't uh, put a price tag on – experience game experience being uh, being in the game under the lights with the pressure having to make decisions having to make plays against you know uh, guys that are trying to make plays against you you know that uh, you can you can practice it but once you get out there and, and uh, it's game time uh, it makes a difference and having quality reps throughout the defense as we move forward um, is certainly going to help us as we as we continue. Uh, we'd like to get some of our guys back for sure uh, as we go. Um, but, um, you know, I think there's a confidence that you gain from playing, performing well in a game. And I think that that hopefully will continue uh, and give us uh, the kind of the needed uh, fact that they, they, they know they can play well in a game. And uh, that's a big difference, and hopefully we'll continue that. Thank you. Yep. How's it going, Coach? Good, how are you? Victory. Um, it seemed like in the game after Mikey Keene threw that interception that the offense was really relying on the run game to you know, seal a victory for you guys. Uh, what do you think that's showing in the um, offense's confidence in Mikey Keene to finish games? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it's the offense's confidence. You know, it was one of those things where just in the, in the flow of that game, the moment of that interception, because that was a one play and done. That was on the, the first play of the series. And so... Uh, you know, we kept getting good field position, you know, and, and probably the disappointing part of that is that we didn't score more points out of that field position. You know, we had the, the one, uh, you know, four play stand at the goal line, unfortunately, you know, so uh, the we were effectively running the ball and we felt like as long as with that style of team that we were playing, we needed to keep the clock moving. And so uh, I have all the confidence in the world in Mikey. You know, I, I do, uh, you know, the big thing is if the ball hit the ground throwing the ball, you know, that was going to stop the clock, you know. And so we just felt like the way we were running the ball, we were at least effective enough to keep the clock moving. And that was probably the main priority. For sure. And speaking of the run game, uh, Elijah Gillum, obviously a great um, pro productive performance. Uh, do you think he's proven at this point that he should be the number one running back going for the rest of the season? Well, we'd love to get Malik back. And, you know, I think what what it's really shown is, a, you know, we keep talking about depth. You know, we've got some real depth at the running back position, you know. And, um, you know, the, the exciting part, the thing that I love for Elijah Gilliam is that, you know, obviously every player wants that opportunity and he's he's taking it and, and really trying to maximize his opportunity. He's doing a great job with it. We're speaking about the run game. Uh, it seems like the run game has picked up speed these last couple of games. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a little bit of a concern early on, but it seems to be hitting its stride ever since Washington State and now Nevada. Uh, how important will the run game be in the uh, game plan against San Jose State and going forward for the rest of the conference games? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that the the main point of emphasis I would just say as far as, uh, you know, we made some tweaks in the run game the last couple of weeks that I think has helped us. Um, you know, and 
when you when you play a team like a San Jose that's so explosive on offense, you know, at, at the end of the day, like every game, you know, you look at the game that that we just played with Nevada, like that's every game that they play. They play really good red zone defense and they hold teams. It's usually a three point to six point margin of victory or loss for them. You know, like that's how they play. Uh, it's the same thing with San Jose. I mean, that the style of play that they have, you know, we've got to be able to run the ball to help our defense out so that, uh, you know, they're, they're going to try and spread our guys out and make them run all over the place defensively. It's like, we have to help our defense out. But then you look at the schedule to come. Then you've got, you know, a team like Hawaii that does a lot of similar things. So we've got to make a point of emphasis to effectively run the ball the rest of the year because, uh, you know, I do think that Mikey Keene can throw the ball on anybody, but if there's no respect to the run game, you know, it, it, it's a lot harder when you're throwing into eight guys than when you're throwing into, you know, five or six guys. Hey, Coach, um, how, how would you frame Mikey's performance overall uh, against Nevada? I thought he was really efficient. You know, obviously I would love that interception back uh, for him. You know, it's unfortunate. They, the one time that, you know, we didn't get their unbalanced check, it was the one time that they played that coverage and it, it just worked out. The guy made a great play on it. And so, uh, you know, I think he was 13 to 20, take that one out. You know, I mean, he, he, he's very efficient. We didn't ask him necessarily to do a ton, but what he did do a nice job of was, in, in, and we got sacked once, which wasn't his fault. And there was guys open and, and that was a, 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 just an execution thing up front. Uh, you know, but he did a really nice job kind of escaping some stuff that, you know, people don't realize he threw the ball away. The one, uh, you know, he almost – it could have been a safety, you know, and turns it into a throwaway. And then the next play, Elijah Gilliam goes 74 yards on a screen. So, uh, you know, he did some really nice things that don't necessarily show up in the stat line. You know, we had one uh, – the second drive, I believe it was, where, you know, Magdalena's wide open. It's going to be a touchdown. We get beat up front. He does a great job avoiding the sack, getting rid of it. Uh, you know, he did a really nice job, you know, after Cam Beecham, um, you know, he was in there and, and got beat. And then we uh, end up taking a sack on it. The very next play hits Raylan Sharp for, you know, 25 yard gain or whatever on second and 22, you know. And so I think that he did a really nice job just kind of weathering storms and it wasn't all perfect for him. And, and, and they were they were a good defense. So I thought that he did a really nice job uh, kind of handling those situations and, and overcoming some stuff. And then just take me inside the call uh, with two minutes to go, because um, you know Josh Wood's been kind of the the guy sometimes in short yardage situations. Was a little bit of an element of surprise there with Mikey, and and what did Mikey do well on that play? Can you re sorry, sorry? Can you the uh, the, f the with two minutes to go, the yep. fourth and one sneak? Yeah, just, just yeah. Was so that kind of a little element of surprise since Mikey's not usually known well, as a running? Quarterback? Yeah, we you know we <laughs> that the good thing is they took a timeout right before that, so we had a chance to think about it. Uh, you know, and we, I was standing there with, uh, with Coach Skip, and we're looking at the chains, and we're like, man, like, we've got to be able to sneak this for a yard. And so, uh, you know, we went up, tried to freeze them, see if they would jump. They didn't. So we just said, you know, get under center and go for it, you know. And, and we're not necessarily a sneak team, which I think is the element of surprise. That's not necessarily our deal. Uh, you know, but in, in that moment, you know, you, you, if you're going to go down with your with the quarterback, it's going to be the starting quarterback. You know, it's, it's one of those things where we're going to put him in and put him in that position, and he was committed to getting the first down. So I think that, uh, you know, that's not necessarily our M.O., but, you know, he did a really nice job because they did everything they could to stop that. You know, they, they, they really plugged up the A and B gaps, and the fact that he was able to bounce that and get the first down, was it, it was a big deal. Coach, with the criticism on Mikey, how have you tried to weather this storm with him and then how big is that <clears throat> excuse me how big is that win for him in terms of his confidence moving forward you know it, it, the the best part in my opinion about Mikey through this whole thing is he's very resilient and i mean it's it's crazy it is crazy the stuff that is said to these 18 to 23 year old guys via social media and you know i mean it, it's crazy you know and you know, so it, it, you can't escape it. And, um, you know, some people should be ashamed of themselves. Just some of the stuff that's said, it's, it's crazy. But, you know, I think that, uh, you know, what Mikey's able to do is you're able to talk about it with him. Like, it's not like you're, like, walking on eggshells with it. And he knows we need to not throw the ball to the other team and, and all that. You know, he he knows that. and But he's also a really good player that, 
you know, you look at it over the course of the season, you know, 90 to 95 percent of the plays he plays at a really high level. And it's those five percent of the plays that, you know, he, that, that we got to get back, you know, that we got to you know, we can't have those moments because they're so critical, you know. So, uh, you know, I, I think his confidence, you know, he, he does a very good job just kind of managing it. And he knows that, like, hey, it's just part of the deal. It's a position he signed up for just like it's the, it's the position I signed up for, you know, like we're in this position and we got to be able to handle the good and the bad. And, you know, and so he's he's very mature in that sense. And, uh, you know, I think just the, the win, I think probably as much as anything is just a, a team confidence thing as much as his personal confidence. Good morning, Coach. Uh, can you just talk about – in some of those crucial moments that, that kind of extended drives throughout the game, the, the big 74-yard uh, screen pass, and there was a couple plays, or there was another screen pass earlier in the game that extended a drive that you went on to score. Are those kind of checks by Mikey that he's seeing at the line, or are those play calls that are called in and you guys are just seeing that from up top as well? Yeah, Mikey doesn't really check a lot at the line of scrimmage as far as plays, he, but he gets himself protected more than anything, or, or at least the illusion of – he should be getting protected. He, he handles that stuff. Uh, really what it was was the, the screen to Elijah Gilliam was something that that was actually a third and – more third and extra, extra long call. And we just felt what they were doing to us on the third and medium situations. I just said, you know what, I'm going to call this at this situation because of what they were doing. That was more of an in-game kind of move a call out of a, one area of the call sheet to a different spot. Uh, and then, you know, for us, you know, one of the big things is just kind of changing the picture on teams and, you know, showing one formation and getting to another. And, you know, some of that was built to, you know, the I think the one you're referring to is the one to Nate Acevedo, um, you know, on the scoring drive that, you know, we just felt like changed the picture on them and, and created a, a free access lane for, for Mikey to rip the ball out there. And uh, continuing with all the guys that are kind of showing up for you in the backfield, but between the running backs and like we were talking about Josh Wood earlier, talk to me about what that kind of adds to this offense and what it opens up, as well as kind of taking pressure off of Mikey Keen, not have to go out there and throw the ball 30, 35 times. Yeah, the the, the run game and and seeing Elijah Gilliam, seeing Bryson Donaldson, who's, you know, I'm really excited about, you know, the things he's doing and, um, you know, so I, I, the things I'm excited about are, are those things, just as far as just kind of seeing some depth being built there, uh, you know, with with Malik being out right now. And, you know, Josh Wood is just a special skill set. And, you know, I, I, I said it last week where we've got to take hits off of Mikey, you know, because, the you know, the some the best thing he does is drop back pass. But if you do that enough, you're going to get hit, and that's going to affect your performance. In a way – you know, when you do put Josh Wood in there or you're able to effectively run the ball, like those are – it's not plays off for Mikey, but it's plays off for Mikey. And it's able to, you know, kind of alleviate a, a, a moment. You know, when you look at – you know, if we play – in this game we played 60 plays, but, you know, and if you play 65, 70, 75 plays, those handful of plays where you can just kind of like, you know, not let your guard down but relax for a second because you're not getting hit and you're not get you know, like that's going to help him in the long run for sure. Morning, Coach. Morning. I appreciate your honesty about the social media comments. Does stuff like that galvanize the team? And did that kind of play a role in this team coming back and winning against Nevada? No, I, I think that, you know, we've got a bunch of guys that football is really important to them. And uh, there's a standard here, you know. And, and the reality is, like, I would rather be here where there's, there is expectations and people expect us to play well and – like, I want that. Like, I, I personally, I want that. Like, I want to be where there's some place where the expectation – people should be upset with play calls or, you know, whatever. You know, I, I don't think it necessarily galvanized the team. I think being 3-3 three and three and losing a game that we felt like we, we should have won really did, and I thought our guys responded. Uh, you know, again, I know Coach Skip mentioned it. The sideline was electric. Uh, you know, I, I think Bulldog football was really what galvanized the team. You know, I think Coach Skip – you know, I mean, I, I, yeah, I've, I've got my opinion on him. Okay, he, he's doing a great job, you know, and he's the one that galvanized the team, in my opinion, you know. And, and so, uh, yeah, my comment on social media is more so just directed at, you know, these players are 18 to 23 years old. Like, like they're, they're human, you know. And so, and, and, and again, they're the, they're the men in the arena. So uh, I have to ask about the run game, and specifically Bryson Donaldson. Is it getting hard to limit his carries when he's looking this good? I mean, nine carries last week was more than we've seen from him in weeks past. Yeah, you know, I, I think that 
uh, the exciting thing about Bryson is his, is his best football still ahead of him. Uh, I've mentioned it before. He is such a high character, hardworking young man. I mean, he, he's he's just an impressive guy to be around, and it's and and it's exciting for him. Uh, you know, I I think that uh, he's a good change of pace for Elijah Gilliam, just because you know Elijah's got some elusiveness and some wiggle to him and then you put Bryson and he's I mean he is a physical downhill runner but he's also got speed I'm excited at some point he's gonna break a big one he almost did the other night he almost got out of it and he got tripped up he's gonna break a big one and I, I'm, I'm excited to see it so Skipper has his identity Scott asked about it right the physical play running the ball trenches is that something that maybe you lean on this week and maybe open up some stuff for Mikey Keene? Or how, do, how does the run game incorporate itself moving forward? Is it going to always be more run-oriented than pass-oriented? Yeah. No, so at the core of things, the goal is to win the game. And I do believe that part of our job on offense, to help, our defense is really good, but we've got to help them. Like they can't go out there and play 90 plays – every week and expect them to hold up every single week, you know? And so, you know, I think that there's an element of playing complimentary ball that, that we've got to make sure that we embrace as an offense, you know, and um, I've got to set my pride and ego aside. You know, I'm, I, I would love to throw the ball for 350 yards every game. Like I would love for us to just light people up that way. Uh, but at the same time, like we've got to be able to run the ball effectively to be able to take some, pressure off of our defense playing that many snaps because uh, you know I think that that's a big part of the the complimentary side of winning football and do we need to be more explosive yes do we need to score more points 100 percent but we also need to make sure that we do everything we can to help our team win the game and and running the ball is going to help us do that coach there was a lot of talk about get back against New Mexico um but the game against San Jose State last year was not pretty, and Mikey took an especially big hit. Is, is that is there some extra emotion in this one at all? Well, you know, I think that when you when when you reflect back, and I, I watched that game yesterday. You know, just I mean, it, it was like you know we came out and we weren't necessarily playing great on offense, but it was like on you know like it was kind of almost like the UNLV game this year, where just kind of all three phases we just didn't play well you know we kind of ran into a buzzsaw last year in that game and yeah Mikey took a hit that he probably shouldn't have you know like he probably could have done some stuff to avoid taking that hit um, but he did you know and so um, you know I, th I think there is there, there is an element of that but I think you know it's been spoken a lot about just that the rivalry piece of things aside from how it happened last year you know because I know that two years ago we kind of derailed their you know, they were playing really good football at the time that they came in here. And I think it was 17-10 or something like that that we ended up winning the game two years ago. Uh, you know, I just think it's just a competitive rivalry that, you know, it's, it's I don't want to say it's any bigger get back than just any other loss. You know, we got to, we want the Valley Trophy back. Uh, they go through a coaching change, but they retain their DC. Their DC changes the scheme a lot week to week, but You've seen him against your offense a few times. Uh, how much does this carry over, or is it very different? Yeah, there's there's some some subtle differences to maybe what they were doing last year to what they're doing now, uh, but you can see the the core of things is still there. Um, you know, there's some things that um, you know. I mean, he drops eight defenders, you know, a third of the time, and then he's gonna he's going to blitz, blitz the heck out of you the next, you know, the next snap, you know. So it's one of those things where he does a very good job mixing it up anyways, and he's kind of always done that. You know, he's, I, I think if you look back at, you know, I even watched the 21 game, the 22 game, and the 23 game over the weekend. You know, he, he's always done a very good job just mixing it up and uh, trying to keep you off balance, you know, and, and everything from coverages to fronts to pressures to drop eight. I mean, he does a very good job mixing things up every year, every week. And any returning or new personnel kind of catch your eye for this team? I think their corners are good players. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I think their corners are very good players. They've got some guys up front that are very disruptive. Uh, you know, I, but I, I've, I've been very impressed. Like, when you open up the explosive pass cut up, so every, you know, what PFF deems an explosive pass of, uh, I think it's 15 yards or more, 
you know, I pull that up every week just to see what what are people getting big plays off of in the past game, and and this was the shortest of the season so far, you know, and and that I think that says a lot just as far as everything from how disruptive they are up front to to what they do on the back end. I think uh, I think the corners are, 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 are I've been impressed with them, and um, you know they got got they got good players at every level, but you know I think again that explosive pass cut up being so short was kind of the thing that jumped out at me. Coach, we get to you, talk to you and Coach Coyle and Coach Skipper, but uh, not the other coordinator. Uh, how many pats on the back did you guys share with Coach Baxter after the different special teams made Friday night? That was that was incredible, you know. And, and again, the thing that I that I'm I'm most disappointed about is we should have scored more points out of the field position he was giving us. You know, we turned one of them into a touchdown, uh, you know. But really, the, the that was a big deal, and uh, you know, he he worked so hard at. You know, Coach Bax does such a good job. He works so hard at trying to schematically find the advantages, and and he found one, and we exploited it. You know, but then you look at the, uh, you know, the punts that we were able to pin them down there. You know, that was actually a weakness of ours on special teams at the beginning of the year. We had multiple opportunities to do that, and we missed them. And then it's like, you know, we made adjustments and we do different things during pregame now. I mean, you know, he. he I was going to say this, John Baxter, there is nobody that reinvents themselves and is uh, more willing to uh, evolve than him. And that's a, that's a guy that could easily say, I've been doing this this one way for a long time, and, and he's not. you know. And so he's definitely got his, his share of them, but they're well-deserved. And you mentioned uh, Nate Acevedo. We're seeing him more and more. Part of that is you know the injuries you guys have dealt with. But what do you appreciate the most about him and where he's headed? So... So Nate is a guy that, you know, when Josiah Freeman went down and then, uh, you know, Jalen Moss was in a very limited role, you know, in, the, in this game. And so uh, early in the week, he just, I mean, he might get mad at me for saying this, but he told me, like, I'm going to be ready on Friday night. Like, I'll be, I'm going to be ready. And he had a great week of practice, you know, and, and I think that he recognized with, Josiah down, Tim Greer was down, Jalen Moss was extremely limited, and he recognized this team needed somebody to step up, and he did it. And uh, you know the the and, I, and I'll, I'm going to share this story. We put in a play that Josh Wood had, Josh Wood ended up scoring on. Uh, you know we faked a reverse to Mikey. You know it was kind of an elaborate deal, and uh, we had a shift to it and all this stuff. And he texted me the night after we put it in. I said, can I get personnel onto the Josh Wood play? I'm going to get it done. This day and age, you got a guy asking. He's not asking for targets. He's asking for opportunities to go block for block for his friend and said, I'm going to get it done. And he's like 165 pounds, and he – I mean, he did a phenomenal – he blocked their defensive end, who was a really good player. I mean, he – and he did a phenomenal job. He got the play started, you know. And so, I, to me, like, the concept of team and – playing for each other and all that like that's like that just showed me like what really what Nate's about and um, it was really cool to see really cool opportunity for him and lastly I want to give you a chance to talk about uh, the blackout Friday night although coach Coyle said it doesn't matter if the dogs are wearing purple coming from Olympia Washington would you have a problem with purple uh no no we were the, I think the the cool part about the the, the blackout stuff is Coach Coyle is one hundred percent right. Like once the ball's kicked, it doesn't matter. But it's about the players. It's not about us. It's about the players, you know. And so uh, I think that they're. I think it's cool for them. They're excited about it. Uh, you know, just everything from recruiting. I'm really, I'm thankful for for the people that you know that made it possible for it. You know, and to see our guys' enthusiasm about it. You know, at the end of the day, it's about the players. Like without them, there's no us. You know, so I thought it was uh, it was a cool gesture from from somebody to to make that happen for us, um, and and then it was cool to see our, our guys' excitement about it, like genuine excitement about it and enthusiasm.